Now, the subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, extraneous materials for the record subject to the length limitation in the rules. In early April of this year, the Department of Homeland Security struck an agreement with the UAE to set up a preclearance facility in Abu Dhabi International Airport. DHS and CBP both say that there is a clear national security benefits to a foreign preclearance facility. Uh, the logic seems to be simple. Clearing travelers abroad before they reach U.S. soil reduces the threat of ter terrorism, costs to the United States taxpayers for processing troublesome travelers. But if terrorists are going to be smart enough to pull off a terrorist attack against us, they will be smart enough to go to a nearby airport that doesn't have a preclearance facility like Dubai, so the national security benefit seems to be unclear at the moment. What seems to be clear is that a preclearance facility comes across as hurting United States air carriers. Unlike existing CBP preclearance facilities, no U.S. airline currently serves Abu Dhabi. The only carrier that does is the state-owned Itaihab Airways. A customer from Asia has two choices. That individual can fly with an American carrier, stop in a European city like Frankfurt or Amsterdam, and arrive in a major U.S. Getaway city, gateway city like Houston, where that individual can expect to wait three hours or even longer to get through customs. Or the individual can fly with Etuhab and stop in Abu Dhabi, go through customs in a half hour, and then fly to any U.S. city. The choice of three hours of waiting to get through customs with an American carrier, half an hour to go through customs somewhere else uh, with Abu Dhabi I mean, Etuhab Airways, international customers uh, certainly will make the choice to go with a foreign carrier. The United States Airlines have difficulty already competing with airlines overseas because many of these airlines are state-owned airlines, especially in the Middle East. Therefore, the companies receive direct and indirect financial support from their own governments. These are the same airlines that the United States airlines have to compete with. Uh, now the United States government wants to contribute to competitive advantage over U.S. air carriers. Uh, one airline tells me it gets 90 percent of its profits from international travel. In fact, that's where it makes money. Uh, it then uses the profit margins from international travel to offer lower prices on domestic travel. Uh, generally speaking, domestic travel is not profitable for American airline industry. So if the Abu Dhabi preclearance facility moves forward, it's hard to see how this doesn't lead to higher prices for domestic U.S. flights and Americans losing their jobs. Uh, CBP went to UAE first asking for permission to put a preclearance facility in an airport where U.S. carriers actually go. Uh, Dubai, Dubai, uh, Dubai, but UAE declined and instead suggested Abu Dhabi. There are no U.S. carriers serving Abu Dhabi because it didn't make economic sense. Dubai had the most traffic. There is now no guarantee that even if U.S. carriers wanted to serve Abu Dhabi, UAE would let it. There's a solution to the problem, move the preclearance facility to an air, airport in the Middle East that the U.S. carriers already have service, like Dubai. So the two issues are economic issues and national security issues that this uh, committee will be addressing and our witnesses will be uh, commenting on uh, this, uh, this afternoon. I will now turn uh, to the ranking member, Mr. Sherman from California for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you. Um, rare is it that a government operation of uh, this size arouses such controversy? Uh, but uh, that's understandable, as the chairman points out. I think this is of slight national security uh, improvement. It just means three planes a day are going to be subject to greater uh, scrutiny. Um, one would say, well, then those who wish us harm might sub be subject to scrutiny if they do something else. But if somebody is in... Um, Abu Dhabi and chooses not to be on one of these pre-screened planes, all they have to do is fly from Abu Dhabi to Lagos and then proceed to the United States. Um, they won't be pre-cleared in Abu Dhabi, they won't be pre-cleared in Lagos. 
uh, unless, uh, well, they, they, uh, you know, especially if they do not declare their interest in coming to the United States until they get to Lagos. Um, we, got, we need to promote tourism. Um, the chairman and I are trying to create a circumstance where Israel is a visa waiver country. Um, Israelis travel easily to Europe, and if they can travel as easily in the United States, we will get those tourist dollars. The, uh, another way to promote tourism would be to allow people to post a bond uh, if the customs officer says, well, for economic reasons, you may overstay uh, and you post a twenty-five dollars or $50,000 bond, then it's clear that you're not going to overstay for economic reasons. The State Department resists this. It interferes with the total carte blanche authority of their uh, visa officers to say you get in and you don't get in. And the visa process is one of the, the greatest deterrents to um, tourism to the United States. And when we have tourism in the United States, we get all the tourist dollars spent here, plus we get about half the airline dollars of people visiting. As to the customs process, I sure hope it doesn't take three hours at Houston. Uh, one of the things I hope we hear testimony on is whether, in fact, Abu Dhabi will have a, um, an advantage. Uh, will it be faster there than it is on average at JFK, Houston, or anywhere else a plane from the Middle East might land? Why would we stop staff Abu Dhabi uh, to the point where the waiting times there, the convenience there is greater uh, than it is uh, elsewhere? Um, there is a slight benefit to all uh, tourism of this, and that is we get 25 officers for the price of five with Abu Dhabi paying 80% uh, of the cost. That means there'll be um, uh, hundreds of people that don't have to go through the process at JFK or elsewhere, and maybe that'll make the line move slightly quicker, and maybe that will enhance uh, our efforts to attract tourism. But I think the chairman is right to, to question, why Abu Dhabi? Why not uh, Frankfurt? Why not Dubai? Why not um, other uh, airports where American carriers uh, are present? Um, we'll want to also hear what uh, uh, restrictions there are and fees would be imposed if an American uh, flag carrier decided to operate in Abu Dhabi and whether they would really be given access. Um, but the fact is, uh, perhaps if uh, we save money because Abu Dhabi is uh, funding 80 percent of this operation, uh, perhaps uh, that will allow the Homeland Security to also provide the services in Dubai whether or not uh, we get uh, uh, a contribution from the Dubai Airport Authority or other Dubai governmental entities. Um, it is uh, understandable that an agency of the federal government subject to sequester, subject to furloughs, subject to waiting times that deter economic activity and tourism to the United States would say, well, gee, can't we get another source of revenue? But if the net effect of this is to diminish um, the number of people who fly on U.S. carriers uh, and to give an unfair advantage to, uh, to the airline uh, uh, based in Abu Dhabi, uh, then what looks like a good deal for American taxpayers may in fact uh, not be, and I yield back to the chairman. Uh, thank the ranking member. Uh Members who wish to uh, make an opening statement uh, have one minute. Mr. Cook from California that, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be, I'll be very quick. I have many of the same concerns uh, about the cost of the American taxpayers and, and why we're doing this. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis, I think I have a, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over the same things that have been mentioned by um, the chair and the ranking member, but um, Right now, I, I just cannot get that through my head why in God's name we're doing this. So I yield back and uh, want to hear what the um, panelists have to say. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Perry from Pennsylvania, recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing attention to this important issue today. I do have strong concerns with the Department of Homeland Security uh, with their plan to establish a U.S. Customs and Border Protection 
preclearance facility at Abu Dhabi International Airport in the United Arab Emirates. This policy, in my opinion, will negatively impact the U.S. economy and, in particular, the U.S. airline industry. The establishment of this facility in Abu Dhabi primarily benefits only a foreign emirate and its wholly owned national carrier, giving it a competitive advantage over U.S. airlines, their employees, and their customers who pay $1.5 billion in annual user fees. And I'll wait to hear the testimony and ask questions. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Yoho from Florida, one minute. I thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking members, for holding this hearing today. This hearing allows us to exercise our proper oversight function over a decision to have a preclearance facility in Abu Dhabi. My goal today is find out, find out why Abu Dhabi was chosen, the criteria that went into that decision, and if there are better uses with our resources. With close to $17, billion, trillion, excuse me, $17 trillion in debt, we must ensure that every tax dollar we spend from the hardworking taxpayers of this country on any endeavor is done strategically and efficiently. I'm curious if other sites in other countries may be a better place to put our resources, and I look forward to hearing what our witnesses have to say on that subject. And I look forward to hearing you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I'll introduce our uh, first witness. Kevin McAllenon began serving and acting as Deputy Commissioner of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection on March the 30th, uh, 2013. Congratulations in your new role. Uh, Mr. Allenon is the, the Chief Operating Official of the 60,000 Employee Border Agency. He previously served as the Deputy Assistant Commissioner in the Office of Field Operations and Director of the Office of Anti-Terrorism. Thank you for being here, and you have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Sherman, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, it's a privilege to appear before you today to discuss U.S. Customs and Border Protection's multi-layered strategy to secure America's borders and facilitate legitimate travel. As a unified border security agency for the United States, CBP has the primary mission of preventing terrorists and terrorist weapons from entering the country. As a key operational component of the Department of Homeland Security, and in response to the tactics adopted by international terrorist organizations, a critical objective of CBP's strategy is to extend our zone of security, and in collaboration with international partners, interdict threats as far away from the homeland as possible. CBP preclearance operations accomplish this objective by allowing for the same functions conducted at a U.S. port of entry to occur on foreign soil prior to departure for the United States. Indeed, Congress has directed DHS to expand the use of this important security program by establishing additional preclearance locations to prevent potential terrorists and inadmissible persons from boarding aircraft destined for the United States. Under the agreement with the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, CBP officers to be posted in Abu Dhabi will operate with a full array of legal authorities and will be empowered to conduct inspections and searches of individuals and baggage prior to boarding aircraft. In fact, CBP officers in Abu Dhabi will have broader authorities than at any other preclearance location. They will be in uniform and they will have access to their full complement of law enforcement tools. Preclearance operations in Abu Dhabi will provide clear benefits to U.S. security in a highly cost-effective manner. In addition to enhancing security by allowing CBP to prevent high-risk travelers from boarding aircraft from Abu Dhabi to the United States, it will strengthen law enforcement partnerships and information sharing with a key international partner in the region, and will improve facilitation of international travel by reducing wait times and increasing capacity at domestic gateway airports. Abu Dhabi is a growing transit hub for global travel and commerce in the Middle East. It is also a strategic transit location for terrorist-related travel including watchlisted individuals in the terror screening database and passengers whose travel history presents intelligence-based risk factors. The UAE receives direct flights from a number of areas with active international terrorist operations and logistics, constituting high-risk pathways for terrorist travel, including Yemen, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, India, and Africa, including Egypt, Nigeria, and Sudan. In response to these terrorist travel threats, Abu Dhabi preclearance will allow DHS to project a core security program closer to source countries for extremist activity and to identify and interdict threats to the United States early in the travel cycle. CBP officers working in a preclearance context will be able to interview, capture biometrics, and examine luggage and electronic media of both known terrorists and non-watchlisted travelers that present intelligence-based risk factors. 
CBP's planned preclearance operation in Abu Dhabi would be extremely cost effective, representing a net increase in CBP's capacity due to the willingness of the UAE to share the financial burden. Under existing statutory authority, CBP is able to receive reimbursement for services related to immigration and agriculture activities. In total, CBP anticipates receiving reimbursement for approximately 85 percent of the cost. At currently anticipated volumes, this means that CBP would gain the equivalent of approximately 15 officers and additional processing capacity of up to 400,000 passengers. As a result, preclearance operations in Abu Dhabi will also aid passenger processing at key international gateway airports in the United States. By the end of the year, there will be four daily flights from Abu Dhabi to U.S. airports. These flights arrive at congested terminals at New York JFK, Chicago O'Hare, and Dulles International Airport, and soon at LAX during peak traffic periods. Given the high percentage of non-U.S. citizens who take longer to process uh, on these flights, passenger traffic from Abu Dhabi contributes to significant wait time challenges that inconvenience all international travelers, including those arriving on U.S. carriers. Preclearance at Abu Dhabi would relieve congestion in these terminals and contribute to reduced peak period wait times for travelers at these key U.S. airports, as well as opening up additional processing capacity for international flights and supporting the U.S. economy with increased travel exports. Etihad Flight 151 is a good example. This flight is a Boeing 777 arriving daily into O'Hare with an average of 380 passengers, directly in the middle of O'Hare's peak traffic period. Preclearance of this flight would remove almost 20 percent of the arriving travelers from processing queues at that time, reducing wait times and opportunity costs for the carriers and for the travelers arriving during this period. Preclearance operations in Abu Dhabi offer CBP and DHS an unprecedented opportunity to project America's border and aviation security efforts into the Middle East while gaining processing capacity and officer resources. This is a cost-effective opportunity to protect the American public and international aviation that should not be missed. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your testimony. I uh, will ask you some uh, questions uh, for five minutes, and we'll try to get in as minute, much as we can before uh, we hear that votes will be some relatively soon. Um, I see two factors involved uh, in this whole situation. One is national security. The other one is economic security. Uh, the preclearance facility uh, placed in an area where, uh, first of all, I ask you uh, why there instead of somewhere else, but also when this decision was made, uh, was there any input and discussion about the economic security of American airlines. American airlines have to compete with foreign airlines that are subsidized by foreign governments. Uh, they undercut U.S. carriers. Uh, U.S. carriers make their money on, a foreign, on foreign travel. They don't make money on domestic travel. Uh, and it, come, it appears on the surface that this uh, will make it more difficult for American airline companies to compete with foreign subsidized companies who will fly directly to the United States. Uh, so economic security, national security, airline industry, as you know, is very concerned about a, a preclearance facility where they can't even fly into, uh, and why uh, this location instead of somewhere else? And the second question is, the economic issue, was that factored in in this decision or not? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first, on the, on the security benefits and, and, and why uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, understand that, as, as the ranking member noted as well, that currently it's modest travel volume, but this is a very strategic location for us from a terrorist travel standpoint. Uh, it's a, as I mentioned, the countries that fly into Abu Dhabi, it's a, it's a central travel hub for a number of places with active international terrorist organizations. Uh, Yemen and the activity of al-Qaeda in the Rim Peninsula is of, of significant concern, uh, as we've seen with the Abdul Muttalib attack on Christmas Day in 2009, the air cargo package plot, uh, underwear attack two, and their continued intent and, and interest in attacking uh, commercial aviation, uh, as stated through their, their publications and elsewhere. We, we need to do our best to secure all of the travel routes from that region. So if you look at the strategy, 
What we're trying to get to all of those locations that are important terrorist travel hubs with significant security programs. We have our targeting capabilities, which are global, uh, that give us a lot of pre-departure information and, and put us in a good position to address risk and threats. But it, having an actual physical presence at the foreign airport, talking to passengers prior to departure with our immigration advisory program, and better yet, with pre-clearance, which is essentially the functional equivalent of a U.S. port of entry, uh, and in, in Abu Dhabi's context, it would give us our full authorities uh, and, and protections to operate there, is, is even better uh, than that. Uh, so we, we are working to project enhanced security programs through all of these strategic transit points for terrorist travel. Uh, we have IEP in five out of the top ten locations. We have preclearance in one, and this is another step in that broader strategy. It's not the only thing we're, we're trying to accomplish or the only location. It's part, part of the overall strategy that does include uh, Dubai, as, as you both noted. In terms of the economic impact, uh, absolutely, uh, we have had in-depth discussions, robust exchanges of views uh, with the air carriers and their representatives, the pilots and their representatives, and, and we appreciate their perspective and, and rely on their partnership in many ways. Uh, that said, the, the economic picture here is really a broader discussion. Uh, we need to facilitate travel to the United States. Each traveler coming spends over, overseas traveler spends over $4,000. Every 33 travelers creates a U.S. job. We are, we are struggling uh, with, to keep up with the pace of international aviation growth. 12% over the last three years, 4% expected over the next five. Uh, our staffing has been flat during that time. So we need to come up with all potential ways to alleviate uh, that, that congestion in our international gateway airports. We're transforming our arrivals process. We've submitted a strategy to Congress that includes uh, staffing increases in the, in the administration's 14 budget. Uh, and we're working on partnerships li like this in Abu Dhabi to try to address this from all angles. Uh, Excuse me, let me, let me cut to the chase, or have okay. you cut to the chase. Doesn't this put an economic disadvantage to American airlines, companies, what? that we have a facility where y'all are working, where American Airlines cannot fly in and out. We are helping a subsidized airline to fly their people to the United States. Uh, doesn't this put an economic disadvantage to American airline companies who are already struggling? I mean, that's, that's just the question. I, I can definitively assert, Mr. Chairman, that if American Airlines were prevented from flying in and out of Abu Dhabi, we would not establish a preclearance location there. We have negotiated guarantees in the preclearance agreement that there will be access, equal access, non-discriminatory for American carriers. They will be non-discriminatory non in terms of the charging of fees for gate access, et cetera. Uh, absolutely, there, there's, n there's not going to be a U.S. operation where U.S. air carriers are prohibited from flying. Well, my time has expired, but do we have that in writing from them? Yes. That they will allow, allow American airline companies to fly in and out of that location? It, it's in the preclearance agreement, and the Abu Dhabi Airport Company has invited uh, United and Delta. They, they met in May, toured the preclearance facility. They, they would like them to establish service and, and are, are continuing to, to talk with them. Uh, that, that tells us that they're sincere uh, in, in their agreement. We'll hear from the uh, ranking member, Mr. Sherman, from California. Five minutes. Uh, it may be that Congress should be providing you with more resources to cut the wait times for all inbound uh, tourists. This would not only help us economically, because you point out how important those tourist dollars are, but also uh, when we he talk to people who visit the United States, uh, the, the process of getting here, whether it be getting the visa or going through your operation, does not win friends and influence people for the, the United States. Um, I'd point out that the cost of this program is not just the 15 percent we're paying. Your officers who live abroad will be paying less in U.S. income taxes. Uh, they'll be spending their money abroad. So our, uh, the, the, the savings may not be as, as much as you've determined. Uh, I'll be interested in looking at that agreement. It is not enough to say that the fees for gates would not be discriminatory because uh, Echad is government subsidized. So they could charge Echad uh, a huge flat fee and then give them money back. And then they could charge the U.S. airlines. So we want to make sure that those fees are reasonable as compared with other airports. Um, you put forward the idea that uh, this is going to enhance um, our security. Uh, we don't want bad people with weapons on U.S. bound aircraft. The number one way to prevent that is to go, people go through security at the airport and we check to see if they have uh, weapons or bombs or explosives on them. 
A second approach is we don't let somebody on if they don't have a visa, uh, and hopefully our visa officers uh, say no to those who pose a national security risk. They may be from a visa waiver country, but we hope that the citizens of those countries, for the most part, don't uh, bear us ill. But let's say, God forbid, you've got somebody at the airport at Abu Dhabi. Uh, they've got weapons uh, somehow in a way or explosives that aren't going to be detected. They've got a visa. And so the question is, will the pre-clearance of the planes that go directly to the United States stop them, assuming they know that there is pre-clearance and assuming that they would just as soon have as little scrutiny as possible? Um, so let's say this person is at the Abu Dhabi airport with a visa. Couldn't they just buy a ticket to Frankfurt and then buy a ticket from Frankfurt to JFK? And if they chose that as their travel plan, uh, wouldn't they, uh, or to Lagos, whatever, if they think Frankfurt is uh, too careful, um, wouldn't they uh, be able to avoid the pre-screening uh, and, uh, and get on a plane bound for the United States? Um, obviously, if, if they go straight through our pre-screening there at Abu Dhabi, that gives you one more chance to catch them. Uh, they'll know that. and. Uh, they may be, uh, so tell me, what would stop the person that chooses to go to Frankfurt or Lagos uh, from Abu Dhabi? And our responsibility, uh, Congressman, is, as anti-terrorism and, and trade facilitation professionals is trying to reduce the, the overall risk uh, on, on air travel to the United mm -hmm. States uh, to, to enhance our, our security. And, and this is a step forward in, in, in doing that. Uh, anything that, and again, it's a very strategic location, a top 10 uh, location for, for terrorist-related travel transiting through, uh, and it's a step forward in, it, in that process. I, uh, the, the, go ahead. But, but you don't have a direct question. It's not like this person, if they chose to go to Lagos or Frankfurt on their way to the United States, would be subjected to that preclearance. That was actually the part I was getting to. Anything that we can do that, that diverts and redirects a, a terrorist operative's preferred travel route, makes it more difficult uh, for them, that reduces risk. That helps us be, become more effective. Uh, and as I noted, we are trying to project enhanced security programs to all of those areas that we think are strategic for terrorist travel. I, I think the addition to U.S. security is very slight. We're positing the idea that somebody is smart enough to get a visa, smart enough to um, have non-detectable weapons or explosives, uh, so a, an effort that at reach, least reaches that level, which isn't, a, uh, you would think, would just go from Abu Dhabi to a third country, avoid the preclearance. Um, so. I think we have to evaluate this on an economic basis, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing you answer the questions of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Cook from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, some of the data that I have suggests that there's a relatively small number of people that come through that, that airport, and of course it goes back to this question of, uh, um, if you're going to have a pre-clearance, why not do it at an airport where there's a large volume of people coming in instead of a, an area that's stereotyped as uh, a launch point for, for terrorists? And I was thinking to myself, uh, I always try and put myself in the, uh, my district, nay, whether it's going to pass the smell test. And uh, the 8th Congressional District are going to say, hey, did you hear that Cook uh, is supporting this pre-clearance facility in Abu Dhabi? And they'd say, Abu Dhabi? Uh, you know, the average person on the street is saying, since when has Abu Dhabi been the, the focal point of all these flights coming in there? Wouldn't it be smarter to do some of these other airlines or some of these other uh, airports throughout the country? So. Just the sheer number as compared to other locations. Can you address that question, please? Uh, absolutely, Congressman. Uh, in terms of why not, uh, why wouldn't we be interested in doing preclearance at an airport with a large volume? We, we absolutely are. Uh, we, we are in Toronto uh, now. We're very open to doing it in locations in, in Europe and Asia. Uh, the, the criteria that, that we're looking at uh, to, to expand preclearance 
uh, is several fold. One is there a security benefit. Two, is there a passenger facilitation benefit? That's, that's both the numbers uh, of, of passengers traveling to that airport, whether there's a U.S. carrier presence, uh, whether there's willingness to grant uh, U.S. law enforcement personnel our proper authorities, uh, our, our proper protections in that country. And very importantly, and that's what's present here, uh, given the financial uh, situation, is the potential for, for burden sharing and partnership and reimbursement of our expenses. Uh, so we're, we're looking for opportunities that, that meet those criteria, and it would be great to have it at a higher volume location. That said, we are in strategic high volume locations with our immigration advisory program today at London Heathrow, at Frankfurt, Charles de Gaulle, Tokyo Narita, uh, in, in 11 locations around the world. So th this is another opportunity uh, for us to increase our security prior to departure in a very cost effective manner. And it's not exclusive of, of larger locations uh, or locations that your district might recognize as, as passing the smell test as a, as a larger uh, hub. The gentleman yields back his time. Uh, chair recognize the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Lowenthal. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I share some of your concerns about why the impact upon U.S. carriers and, and uh, why we're doing this and uh, some of the issues that were raised by the ranking member and Mr. Cook also about why Abu Dhabi. The question I have is that, and I apologize for coming late, uh, so I, you, you may have answered this already. In, in my background, background study about this, it said that approximately 80 to 85 percent of the costs will be paid for by uh, the, the Emirat, uh, a, the, uh, I guess it's the uh, uh, UAE. Uh, I'm, what I'm wondering is exactly what will they be paying for and not paying for? And is this a precedent that we want to go throughout the world that when we set up customs and border protection pre-clearance, we want that nation to pay for it? And what relationship will they have to the employees that are there? And who will they be accountable to? And what does it mean when they're paying the, the freight? And is this what we want to happen throughout the world? And are we going to ask the Canadians and the Caribbean and others to now to pick up the costs also? Is it just in, uh, in Abu Dhabi? Thank you, Congressman. In terms of the, the reimbursement provisions, uh, the, they're under existing statutory authority, both in, in Title VIII and the Immigration Naturalization Act, Natural Nationality Act, and in Title VII, uh, the Agriculture uh, Title. Uh, basically, they allow us to collect uh, reimbursable uh, services for those aspects of the operation, immigration and agriculture. The customs aspect of our operation uh, is, is prohibited under the COBRA statute in, in Title 19. So that, that's a, a separate uh, issue. So it, it's for the immigration and agriculture, the facility, the services, all the things that are necessary to support our immigration and agriculture operations. That's what's reimbursable. In terms of how it's reimbursable, uh, in ter there's not a direct relationship between uh, our officers that would be deployed and the Abu Dhabi government. This is paid into user fee accounts, very similarly to how we receive funds from U.S. carriers, from other foreign carriers uh, per passenger, and it goes into our, our, our overall salary funds for CBP, which is a combination of appropriations and user fees. So these officers' jobs are not dependent on, on Abu Dhabi. They're, they're, it's part of a, a, a broader uh, CBP uh, appropriation structure. Is this a precedent that will occur with all new pre-clearance facilities? And are we going to ask the existing ones to do, you mentioned Toronto, to also pick up the same share of costs? Uh, well, in terms of the precedent, right, right now we're not in a position to expand preclearance uh, without a reimbursable agreement. Uh, we, we don't have uh, the funding available to do that. Uh, so in terms of the immediate future, if we were going to be asked to, to and, and look at other strategic locations, that we would have to have a, a cost-sharing aspect to that, uh, absent specific directions or, or appropriations from Congress. Uh, in terms of asking existing locations, uh, that, that's probably not feasible. Those are, those are long-standing agreements uh, since 1952 with Canada, for instance. Um, you know, it, it does provide a, a value for, for both uh, the, the country that where the preclearance airport uh, facility is, uh, as well as for our uh, security and facilitation operations. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're in a position to go back to the existing partners. Again, I just want to say I share this. Still, I'm not convinced. I, I, I have concerns that 
I'm willing to look look at this, but I'm I, again I'm most concerned about the impact upon the U.S. carriers and also what precedent we're setting. Thank you, and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, we are in the process of voting on the House floor. There are six votes. Um, we will reconvene immediately after the sixth vote. Uh, we do have time for one more member to uh, ask questions. Uh, Mr. Perry from uh, Pennsylvania for five minutes. Uh, to the other members of the subcommittee, uh, we'll start back uh, immediately after votes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McLennan, uh, when negotiating the reimbursement agreement with Abu Dhabi, did the U.S. government's representatives consider the competitive effects on the U.S. airline industry? Um, and what was the, can you tell me the level of exploration of other alternatives, whether it would have been like uh, Kuwait or Dubai or something like that? Uh, and most importantly, someone without a, a competitive advantage gained from a uh, you know, sovereign owned foreign airline. Absolutely, Congressman. Uh, just on the on the second part of that question, first, uh, do we consider other locations? Uh, ab absolutely. The engagement with the United Arab Emirates, it, it, our interest does not just extend to Abu Dhabi. We're very interested in, in Dubai. That that's also a very strategic location for terrorist travel. It's a larger volume. U.S. carriers serve that. There's a lot of attractive aspects to having a presence there, and, and we're very interested in continuing to pursue that. Uh, in terms of the overall regional effort, DHS uh, and CBP engaged many governments in this region in response to the, the emerging aviation security threat from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula over the last several years. There's been ongoing conversations. We have a, an immigration advisory program now in, in Doha, Qatar, uh, as a result of that engagement. Uh, we, we have spoken with, with uh, the government in Kuwait and, and others as, as well on these critical issues. So this is not a solely focused, limited, special uh, uh, focus here. Uh, in terms of negotiating and considering the competitive effects, I would say absolutely, because that, that's why we, we negotiated the key provisions that provide uh, U.S. carriers access on, on a non-discriminatory basis and non-discriminatory fees. That, that was a concern of ours that we wanted to emphasize to make sure they had uh, access. Uh, we also considered, as, as I mentioned in the earlier questioning, the broader economic benefits of, of increasing our capacity for international travel. Uh, we, we do have important relationships with the UAE in terms of a $20 billion trade surplus, 1,000 U.S. companies in, in the Abu Dhabi, 45,000 U.S. citizen jobs uh, affected there, uh, a great defense relationship. Uh, there, there are many aspects of, of the economic piece that are not just focused uh, on, on the concerns expressed by the U.S. carriers that, that I'm cognizant of. Uh, and, and, and concerned about. Okay. And I just want to make sure, and I appreciate that. I'm trying to keep an open mind about this thing, but uh, when we talk about the economics, as the chairman has already stated, it's, it's not just the economics for the federal government, but the economics for uh, American citizens via their employers and the folks that, uh, that travel in and out and, and how they get there. Uh, another question is, uh, I have a question regarding the, you talked about the additional security benefit. And, I'm just trying to figure out what it is. If I'm a terrorist and I know you have a pre-clearance facility here and you're kind of using it to vet passengers and make sure that you take a close look at ones that might be bad actors and that we wouldn't want to come to the United States, what would stop me from just going somewhere else? I mean, if, if, if you're advertising it that way, when I, if I'm a terrorist and I got any brains at all, wouldn't I just go somewhere else? Again, that, that's the, the key concept of, of risk management. We want, we want to constrain their options. We want to shut down different routes. And this is a very strategic point from, from regions of concern. A lot of these flights from, from uh, source countries for extremist activity are coming through the Arabian Peninsula. They are coming through the UAE and Abu Dhabi. We'd like to close off one of those outlets with our, with our most uh, strongest security program that we can project abroad. So what, but we're still engaged in trying to, to address all of the other uh, locations as well. So it's, it's not an either or, it's part of a broader uh, approach. Uh, as you noted, the security benefits are significant. We get to question the individuals, we get to take biometrics, we have access to our screening systems, examine their luggage, all sorts of things that, uh, prior to departure uh, that, that we can't do in other places. Prior to departure, I mean, this is, this is still done with each passenger at some point along the trail, right? Correct. I mean, it's... Correct. And so it is going to be done. The question is, is do you do it prior to, because it'd be the United States doing it in a pre-clearance manner as opposed to the host nation. Is that what we're talking about here? Absolutely. And if you look at, you know, the last four or five major terrorist attack attempts, 
on aviation. It's not been on, on flights domestically within the, within the U.S. as in 9-11 due to TSA's efforts, due to our efforts at the border. It, it's been uh, the liquid explosives plot was from the U.K. to the U.S. Abdul Muttalib was, was, was uh, flying from foreign to the U.S. Uh, the underwear bomber, too, was going to be the same scenario as well as the air cargo plot. So we, we really think we need to project our security to the prior to departure area for both passengers and cargo. So one last question, then. If I'm a, an American carrier, don't I want the maximum security on my aircraft, not only for the safety of the passengers, but for the safety of the aircraft itself? And so why wouldn't it, are the American carriers they're advocating for this be, on a security standpoint or not? I think the American carriers are, are very open uh, to us impl implementing these types of security arrangements, and they, they prefer it at airports that they're flying from, no, no question. That said, by securing overall avi global aviation, it does help protect the American aviation industry as well. Uh, an attack on a, on a foreign carrier flying to the U.S. would also have a devastating impact, as we've seen with each shock of a successful attack or attempt on commercial aviation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. It's my understanding that none of the other uh, Committee members have questions of you, Commissioner. Uh, I would uh, uh, ask that you uh, furnish us a copy of the agreement uh, that you mentioned in your testimony. And you're excused. We'll start with a second panel immediately after uh, the votes are concluded, which should be about 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
committee will uh, come to order. Uh, Nicholas uh, Calio is the president and chief executive officer of Airlines for America, the trade association for the country's leading airlines, whose members and affiliates transport more than 90 percent of all U.S. airline passenger and cargo traffic. Prior to joining A4A in January of 2011, Mr. Calio was City Group's executive vice president for global government affairs after he served President George W. Bush is assistant to the President for Legislative Affairs from January 2001 to 2003. Captain Lee Moak is the ninth President of the Airline Pilots Association International. Prior to becoming a B, trying, prior to becoming a B-767 Delta Airlines Captain, Captain Moak served nine years in the United States Marine Corps as a fighter pilot. Uh, Mr. Callio, we will start with your testimony. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Poe, Ranking Member Sherman, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, testify today on behalf of Airlines for America. Uh, we also sincerely appreciate this committee taking an interest in this issue. Uh, we will make clear that the administration's agreement with the United Arab Emirates to place the U.S. Customs and uh, border protection preclearance facility in Abu Dhabi is a bad deal for the United States, its economy, its airlines, and, its pass and their passengers. In other words, your constituents. The long-term implications of this agreement and the administration's apparent future plans for other preclearance uh, facilities are dramatic and will, will result in a diminution of services to cities across the United States, including many of your communities. What we have here basically is the United States government picking winners and losers in the international aviation business, and the winners are the international competitors of U.S.-based airlines. This is really a tale of two competing airlines, and it is a matter that CBP is claiming national security. It's also a matter of economic security, and they play into each other. On the one hand, you have the U.S. airline industry, which is at an inflection point. Our passenger carriers managed to make a collective profit across the industry three years in a row now. Last year, that amounted to 37 cents per in-plane passenger. That follows the post-9-11 decade in which we lost over $55 billion and 160,000 of our employees. In our reality, we operate in a business environment that is hostile at worst and neglectful to what is happening at best. U.S. Airlines and our passengers are subjected to a crushing burden of federal taxes and fees, myriad regulations that have nothing to do with safety, horribly outdated infrastructure, and very stiff foreign competition, which is why A4A, uh, and in some fashion as well, ALPA is advocating for changes on all of these fronts under the framework of the national airline or aviation policy. Uh, as both of you gentlemen noted earlier, the international routes that we fly, that U.S. Airlines fly, are the most profitable part of our business and subsidize many of our domestic routes. If you impinge on those international routes, you impinge on domestic routes eventually. Our success on these international routes is dependent upon our ability to compete with non-U.S. airlines and the ability of CPB to um, process passengers and cargo coming into the country. Their ability to accomplish this basic task has been in crisis for years. Processing times for entering the U.S. average one hour and sometimes three hours and more. And we would encourage committee members to try out JFK uh, or Miami or Dallas or some of the other ports of entry to get a firsthand look at what's actually going on at our borders. That's the U.S. reality. Our foreign competition's reality is much better. A number of these airlines, like Etihad, are state-owned and state-supported and are viewed by their government as strategic assets to be used to expand their economies, diversify their economies, and grow jobs. For the UAE, this is not a national security issue. It's a commercial play. It's about diverting traffic that otherwise would fly on American metal to their own planes for which they don't have the population to fill. They have 399, the, the Middle Eastern carriers currently have 399 wide-body jets on order. That doesn't count what's already in their fleet. That's more than twice what all U.S. carriers combined have. Their populations do not support that kind of traffic or that kind of capacity. 
In addition, these governments and their airlines have made clear publicly, repeatedly, that their goal is to make airports like Abu Dhabi the world hub. They have further made clear that an integral part of the plan, in fact, the indispensable part of the plan, is to do this by skimming international passengers from U.S. carriers. So what we have here basically is the United States government facilitating the business strategy of these foreign governments and their airlines. If they are successful, it will be much easier to fly into this country if you fly through Abu Dhabi than it is if you fly directly to JFK, Houston, Miami, Chicago, Dulles, or other points of entry. This accommodation, as noted by Etihad CEO, will encourage travelers to book their travel through Abu Dhabi to avoid the lines at U.S. airports that can't be processed in timely fashion by Customs and Border Protection. You all know that this agreement contravenes the direction of this committee, or not this committee, of this Congress in the 2013 Consolidated Appropriations Bill. Try to conclude very briefly. Um, no matter how you dress it up, it's inappropriate and harmful to the, to the interests of U.S. industry and its passengers um, to take this action. CBP, working in partnership with airlines, has already pushed out our borders electronically. Together we take extraordinary measures to vet passengers before they get near the airport, let alone when they're in the airport. There is no indication that there's any shortcoming in these measures. Their own testimony, if you look at it, is a testament to the measures that are taken currently today. And this agreement won't be tax-free. We shouldn't be spending any money whatsoever outside of the United States. What we have consistently said is that you need to fix the problem here first before you fix it, try to do something overseas. And we'd be happy to take any questions and hope to address some of the points uh, that Deputy Commissioner McAleenan made in his, his testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Captain Moak. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Sherman, it's an honor to be here today to represent the more than 50,000 pilot members who fly for 33 U.S. <clears throat> and Canadian airlines. As you know, government policy and regulations can make or break an industry. And this is why ALPA is focused on the harm that a U.S. Customs and Border Protection preclearance facility in Abu Dhabi will inflict on the U.S. airline industry and its tens and thousands of employees. Make no mistake, the U.S. airline industry and its workers are driven to compete and prevail against our foreign competitors. But our industry cannot prevail or even keep pace while hindered by our own government's actions that make it harder for us to compete. Unless Congress intervenes now, U.S. taxpayers will assist one of the U.S. Airlines' strongest foreign competitors in the form of a CBP preclearance facility. In the Wall Street Journal, the chief executive officer of Etihad, the state-owned national airline of the UAE-based and UAE-based in Abu Dhabi, recently said of our CBP facility, and I want to quote, would support Etihad's expansion as an international carrier and boost Abu Dhabi the largest and richest of the seven emirates in the UAE as a global aviation hub, unquote. Before I get into why we oppose the site, let's look at the big picture for U.S. airlines. The U.S. airline industry is the most heavily taxed of all U.S. industries, and passenger protection regulations place another financial burden on our airlines. At the same time, the U.S. airline industry is competing with foreign airlines that are often state-owned or heavily state-sponsored and do business with huge advantages such as tax-free local and such as a tax-free local environment and a beneficial regular regulatory policy. In addition, those foreign airlines have virtually unlimited access to the U.S. markets through open skies agreements. The explosive expansion of these state-sponsored airlines threatens U.S. airlines, particularly on international routes, as you noted earlier. In addition to benefiting from pro-aviation growth policies at home, these carriers can buy new American-manufactured airplanes at below market financing rates, subsidized by U.S. taxpayers. 
They then used these airplanes to compete against U.S. carriers on international routes. Here's just one illustration of the threat. The value of the aircraft currently on order by Emirates, state-owned, state-sponsored airline, is $84 billion, an amount that exceeds the market value of the entire U.S. airline industry. While ALPA supports enhancing the airline customer experience through CBP preclearance facilities, among other solutions, our union backs doing so only were the use of U.S. resources benefit our economy and our workers. Abu Dhabi does not pass the test. CBP facilities allow U.S. bound passengers to clear U.S. customs while in a foreign location, permitting them to go directly to their domestic flight or final destination once they land, a convenience that is a powerful marketing advantage. ALPA supports the 15 current U.S. CBP sites, which are located at foreign airports where U.S. airlines provide a considerable amount of the air service. At least one U.S. airline served each of these airports before there ever was a CBP facility there. The preclearance site planned at Abu Dhabi presents a stark contrast because no U.S. carrier currently flies between Abu Dhabi and the United States, so only Etihad state-sponsored, state-owned airline would benefit. Passengers from Asia or Europe could opt to fly Etihad and connect through Abu Dhabi instead of booking on U.S. airlines because they would avoid long customer lines at U.S. airports. As a result, demand for seats would decline on certain routes and force airlines to reduce or eliminate service. This scenario would cost U.S. jobs and threaten US, the U.S. aviation industry, which, as you know, contributes to 5% of the GDP. I'll uh, end quickly here, if you don't mind. Long custom lines at U.S. airports are already hurting our airlines. ALPA commends the House for its action to prohibit the funding of the Abu Dhabi facility, and we supported the Meehan Amendment to the House Homeland Security Appropriation Bill that prohibits funding using taxpayer dollars. While ALPA currently supports DHS efforts to identify national security threats, opportunity exists to, exists to enhance this security without giving an unfair advantage to foreign airlines. ALPA calls for, and Congress should, force DHS to abandon plans to open this preclearance facility. Congress should pass strong legislation to prevent DHS from using U.S. taxpayer money to provide an advantage to non-U.S. airlines. The United States should appropriately staff our domestic customs and immigration operations to reduce these passenger, passenger wait times at all our international airports, and the United States should adopt a transportation policy that advances the U.S. airline industry in the same way that these foreign government, state-sponsored, foreign-owned companies have been doing. U.S. airlines and their employees are determined to compete. We're not begging for subsidies. We're determined to compete in the international marketplace. But we need a level playing field. So putting a permanent halt to this Abu Dhabi facility is a critical step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you both, and thank you uh, once again for waiting until the, the votes took place. Um, it, one thing that uh, is striking is that the United States airline industry um, has to compete with really foreign governments who also have an airline and they subsidize that airline and there are various countries that that do that um, not just in the airline industry but in the airline manufacturing business whether uh, it's Airbus versus uh, Boeing um, we have been told that this is really not as big a concern as we're trying to make it out to be, that uh, uh, those folks in Abu Dhabi said that uh, American Airlines can fly in there. They just don't. Any comments on that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we don't because it's not commercially viable. There's less than 1,000 passengers a day that go through that airport. We have investments already made in other um, in other hubs, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, 
Paris uh, where we have planes go through now and our passengers traverse. There's a reason for that. We've been there historically. We've made huge investments there, and we have to make huge investments to get uh, slots and gates in Abu Dhabi. Captain Mo. I'd like to go back to the statement that you made just a, a minute before that. You know, you're right. It's one thing to have to compete, and we're not whining in this industry as Americans, but it's one thing to compete with foreign uh, airlines subsidized, subsidized by their governments, but it's an entirely different matter that not only matter, that not only do we compete with that, but we have to compete with our own government subsidizing those foreign airlines. We shouldn't have to compete with that. We shouldn't have to compete with our government subsidizing this preclearance facility or subsidizing other things that give them a competitive advantage. Has there been an analysis made um, as to how this will financially affect uh, the airline industry in the United States, both money-wise and job-wise? Has there been an analysis, give us an estimate, how, the effect, what's going to happen? We are working on one. Experience suggests, however, that there will be an impact and it will be a relatively severe impact over time if their business strategy works. Uh, there's a lot of people who believe that the business strategy is working already because we're not competing with a commercial enterprise, and we are commercial enterprises. Uh, in the last 10 years, U.S. airlines have lost 24 percent of their market. I may have referenced that before. That trend is continuing, the international market, that is. And as you noted earlier, Judge Poe, um, it is those, uh, those profits that we use to subsidize our domestic routes. So it's something we're monitoring very carefully. Uh, but if they are successful in their marketing effort to take business that normally would come from India, and they've already bought a 24% stake in uh, Jet out of India, which will make it a major hub for Indian traffic, and it's India, China, Asia um, that are the growing uh, uh, ridership um, that uh, we are, we're concerned about. Did you want to weigh on? I know you want to weigh on it. Yes, weigh sir. in on it, Captain quickly. Oak. Uh, the previous uh, guest that you had who testified at the panel, uh, perhaps the Department of Homeland Security who said they did an economic uh, study, they took that in consideration, Pro possibly we could ask them to share it, and perhaps uh, uh, we would see that uh, uh, there's not much to that study and maybe they need to focus back on security and not the economics. Now, we're happy we have a financial and economic analysis department that's well regarded. Uh, and like uh, Mr. Callio said, our, our experience has been that this has a negative impact on our airlines and will have a negative impact on our jobs, but we're happy to model that and get that to your committee. Uh, the committee would appreciate the uh, financial and security analysis, both of those, uh, if you have them done. As far as you know, was the airline industry consulted before this preclearance facility decision was made? It depends on how expansive your view of con consult I don't, I don't mean they, they, they ask a flight attendant that's in an airplane as it's flying somewhere. I don't mean that as the uh, uh, asking the airline, but it was, was the airline industry consulted to your knowledge about this decision? No. We were told in 2011, late 2011, that they wanted to place this facility in Abu Dhabi. We and ALPA and others objected to the placement of that facility. We continued to do so. There wasn't very much transparency here, and then just before the announcement was made, they came to visit us to tell us that they were gonna make the announcement that they were close, excuse me, that they were close to an agreement. At that meeting in my office, DHS and CBP um, personnel, including Mr. McAleenan, indicated to us that actually the facility, construction of the facility was virtually complete, which means for that entire period of time, they were going forward as if the agreement was a done deal. I would be candid to say that we feel like we did a lot of talking. Uh, we feel like we were talked to, but not listened to. Uh, and as part of that, at the end of uh, Mr. McAleenan's testimony, Deputy Commissioner McAleenan's testimony, he said that we, the airlines, were open, as far as he knew, to facilities in other places. We have consistently said from the beginning, both orally and in writing, that we are not open to facilities being opened outside the United States until we fix the problem at our borders, which is costing us hundreds of millions of jobs 
and billions of dollars a year, according to a study by the U.S. Travel Association. Are you talking about the time limit, the time wait getting into the United States? Yes, sir. It's driving travelers away. One last question, then I'll turn it over to the uh, ranking member. Uh, one of you alluded to the, the uh, percentage of business American airline companies do internationally compared to foreign airlines. Uh, so how, mu how much of the international business is done by American carriers and what did it used to be? Give me something that we can, we can understand. Can we get back to you on that? Because I don't have the figures off the top of my head. Captain Moak, do you have any idea? In general, in general, uh, uh, major full service international connect carriers do 50% of uh, the flying internationally. There was a time we did much more than that uh, because for the same reasons the Chicago Convention was held in this country, same reasons they speak English when they fly, the U.S. was the leader in the airline industry. That has continued to decay uh, over the decades, uh, due in large part by uh, government policy. And that's why we're here, because everything matters, and this pre-clearance facility matters, because it gives an advantage to a foreign government. The chair recognized the uh, ranking member, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Um, Captain Moak, you said you support the 15 facilities we have now because they're all served by U.S. carriers. Uh, uh, Mr. Calico, uh, can you pronounce your last name for me? Calio. 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 Um, said he opposes any more. Um, are you in support of new facilities if they meet the st standards of the existing 15 facilities, or do you just draw the line at the 15? No. Uh, let me be real clear here because, uh, and, I, and I think we're in line on this, the 15 facilities that are in place mm -hmm. along the Canadian border, uh, Bermuda, in Ireland because of our rich heritage there and down in the Caribbean, we're all there to facilitate Americans traveling to and from those countries. Now if you look at what they're proposing in the Middle East, it's not for Americans, and it's definitely not for Emiratis, because there's not that many Emiratis. It's really a competitive thing. Well, what I'm asking you is, would you support something in Frankfurt? Would you support something in London? I would, I would like to be able to have a discussion on any of those issues, as long as we're staffing our facilities in the U.S. appropriately first. Okay, that, that brings up uh, the, the kind of the next issue, and that is, if this country cared about its economy, cared about our trade deficit, we'd be doing everything possible to get foreign tourists. Um, we'd like, we, you, your two organizations would be supporting our Israel visa waiver bill, and we look forward to getting that support from you. Um, we uh, would be staffing uh, customs and uh, border protection uh, adequately um, so that it was a convenient place to visit. And we'd do that either with user fees on the tourists or we would do it all with taxpayer money. Uh, instead, other countries are spending a fortune trying to get us to visit their countries. And between the visa process and the uh, border patrol process or border protection process, it's hard to, to say we're really welcoming foreign tourists. Um, and I hope that you folks will be back talking about adequate uh, funding so that we're not talking about the three hours that the chairman mentioned. The only reason that Abu Dhabi views this as an advantage is because we have ridiculous waiting times at our airports. If it was smooth at JFK, uh, who would care that it was also smooth at Abu Dhabi? Uh, I sympathize with you having to compete against subsidized airlines and hope that we have some way to either subsidize uh, those who must compete with the subsidized or tax those that are, but uh, it, it is certainly an unfair trade practice for Abu Dhabi to subsidize its airline, uh, especially if that can be uh, documented. Uh, you put forward the idea that Abu Dhabi would be a, uh, a world hub. I think that's pretty impossible. That is to say, I don't think anybody's going to fly from Germany to Abu Dhabi so they can get on a plane and fly back over Germany in order to reach uh, the east coast of the United States. But it can very well be a regional hub uh, for the Middle East and Central and South Asia 
on flights uh, to the uh, to the United States. Um, the uh, the administration. Sir, could I comment on that? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, all you have to do is look about uh, 80 kilometers up the road at Dubai. Mm -hmm. And what you have there is exactly what you're saying that wouldn't happen in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dubai Airport is exactly that, a world hub. It's having an... Does uh, anybody it, fly from Paris to Abu Dhabi, uh, for, to, to Dubai, for the purpose of then getting on a plane and flying over Europe and reaching the United States? Um, no, but if you reverse the traffic flow and think about it in this way, there's, a, there's hardly any human beings that live in that part of uh, right, the Emirates. Right, that's what I said. It would billion. be a hub for the billions of people who live in South Asia, Central Asia, and the Eastern Middle East. That's exactly what's It would going not on. be a hub for South Americans, the Europeans, uh, et cetera. Uh, well, that what would my be that point was, a billion people in India, instead of flying on U.S. carriers, I, I, via Frankfurt, via Paris, or whatnot, I think we're just flowed. arguing about the difference between regional and world hub. Uh, to me, a regional hub serves the, the region of South, Central Asia, and Eastern Mid uh, Middle East. Um, if you want to call that a world hub, you can do so uh, when, you, when you're speaking. Um, the, um, the argument is, though, that if we can get uh, more officers paid for by, uh, by Abu Dhabi, that will mean faster processing times at JFK and elsewhere. Um, Will that lead to more tourists coming to the United States because the waiting time at JFK will be five minutes less because everybody arriving on a HUD uh, Airlines will have been uh, pre-cleared? Are we focusing just on the Middle East traffic and ignoring the opportunity to enhance the visitor experience for Europeans? You are not ignoring it. Uh, the notion that this is going to alleviate traffic into JFK simply is incredible. Last year, Abu Dhabi was the 80th uh, on the list of uh, passengers. I'm not traveling. talking about a minute or two. If you take 2% of the traffic off the 405 freeway, it moves much better. Uh, the question here is, does this diminish waiting times by a minute or two um, at JFK or here or elsewhere? I don't think it does, because last year you had 573 passengers on average a day, half of whom were U.S. citizens coming into the United States from Abu Dhabi. JFK has 35,000 people a day go in. Uh, O'Hare has 15,000, okay. Dulles 10,000. It's, it's a little, I mean, you're saying on the one hand this is going to be enormously big, on the other hand it's going to be uh, quite small uh, in its, in its uh, impact. What? Uh, uh, what do we do to get uh, more uh, CPB officers uh, uh, so that we're not arguing here about, a th you know, uh, how do we, how do, you know, the, the, most of our discussion here is how do we make sure that every single person visiting the United States has a three-hour delay and some don't get through with a half-hour delay by, go, by flying Ahad uh, Airlines? What do we do to get a half-hour delay at most for everybody? Captain uh, Mo? Yes, sir. Uh, one point I, I did want to point out that we support you on the visa issues. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. we've been leading uh, on those issues, and I I'm, I'm hope we get invited back to help you on that Good. because we believe in that. That enhances uh, the economics of the U.S. and the airline industry. Uh, one, one point that gets missed a little bit about a preclearance facility, which really goes to your question, this facility allows them to fly from there. They're talking about current flights, but it allows them to fly from that position, that point, to any place in the United States direct, whether there's a customs facility at that place or you not. you really think Ahad is going to fly into Van Nuys? Uh, I mean, for the most part, the, the, these major carriers are going to fly into major U.S. cities. Well, I mean, I don't you, think you're going to have direct If you had to make service. money, if you had to make money, yeah. uh, you would, that would be a great case to make. But currently, uh, that's not. They have a long view of their aviation. And their long-term view is to make it so, so foreign carriers can't compete with them. So they would fly in not only to the 30 or 40 biggest airports in the United States, but having then having direct service to all the top 40 cities where we have CPB offices, they'd say, let's fly to Wichita, too? Well, Non-stop flights from Abu Dhabi to Wichita filled with passengers? No, a good example. Who want to go to Wichita and don't want to go to JFK? One example would be... Uh, when a foreign carrier flies into JFK, 
and there's a weather divert, and they have to divert up to, uh, for example, Hartford, which has mm -hmm. been a discussion before. Right. Hartford doesn't have the facilities there that are staffed. Uh, if you were pre-cleared already by Etihad, you wouldn't have any of those problems, although in irregular operation one-off, mm -hmm. it is a significant competitive advantage to not have to go through our facilities. Well, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to buy a ticket on Etihad because to JFK because they say, God, if I get diverted to Hartford, it's going to be a smoother experience. They're planning to, to land at JFK, and they're trying to avoid. The, uh, the point avoid. is, by definition, they are avoiding the facilities in JFK right. or any place they go. People they, who buy this ticket are buying it so that they can get a half-hour delay at Abu Dhabi instead of up to a two- or three-hour delay at a U.S. airport. They're going to be flying into a major U.S. city. Uh, Nobody thinks, nobody buys a ticket, say, God, I hope I get diverted to Hartford. No, uh, oh, but it was a point they, I was trying to illustrate. Abu Dhabi, folks leaving Abu Dhabi are trying to go to major U.S. cities where we give them much too long a delay. If we had 30-minute average delays at all our major airports, Abu Dhabi wouldn't be spending this money and you wouldn't be protesting it because it'd be smooth for everybody arriving here. Um, and you could make the same point that the Emirates have 122 Boeing 777s, yeah. the largest fleet in the world, and they have 90 A380s, the largest fleet in the world. And if they had to have, if they had financial transparency, had to compete as a normal airline, we wouldn't be having this conversation we're, either. We're here, the big problem is the subsidy. We're here talking about saving an hour or two of hassle for three planes a day, which is a tiny part of the giant problem, which is major subsidies, particularly in the Gulf, uh, and major delays at U.S. airports, which are not only bad for your industry, uh, but bad for the much bigger piece of the, pie, of, the, of the pie, which is the tourist dollars that are spent once they're here. You're, uh, you're the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we need those tourists here. We need them spending money. We need, and uh, we discourage them in so many ways. And these delays um, are, are just complete. And I, so speaking of delay, I've delayed the chairman by uh, way too many minutes by uh, going over time. I yield back. Could, could I possibly make just one point in reference to how you would get more officers? No, you can't. Yeah, yes, you can, Mr. Thank Kelly. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean to cause an argument between you. Uh, in terms of airline passengers coming into this country pay fairly high fees to get here. Um, not all those fees go for Border Patrol agents at airports. They go to other border locations. And if this committee were to do an analysis, and we'd be happy to do it for you, uh, and looked at land borders, rail, uh, cars, uh, people walking across the border, there's no fee whatsoever for most of them. So they don't contribute to the system, but they're taking up the bulk of the personnel, the bulk of the CBP assets. And, you know, a slight change in that could create a better situation at the airports right off the bat. That's a good point. We'll let you do that analysis. Did yes, you have sir. a follow-up question? You're saying your analysis will show that not only uh, are tax dollars fully funding those land entry points, but uh, because there's no user fee, but that the user fee paid by air transportation pays not only in full for all the CPB it at airports, not, but no. also contributes to the Tijuana crossing? No, it, it does not cover the entire cost. Okay. So it's not like the air passengers are paying more than 100 percent of the, of the air transportation cost and are subsidizing uh, the it, land? They are paying a certain amount of their cost, some of which is then used to subsidize the other points of entry or the non-air points of entry. So you're saying they're not fully paying the costs of air points of entry, but they are subsidizing the land points? Yes, sir. I, don't, I look forward to reading your study. <laughs> well, I'm totally confused on that issue. The, when, when the fees charged at airports that are used for CBP, are some of those fees then not used at airports, but used at other places like rail and the Tijuana crossing, as the ranking member mentioned. Yes, through placing personnel there at a disproportionate, it's a, it's a misallocation of resources. 
you know, all of what airline passengers pay should be used for personnel to cover air points of entry. That simple. All right. Oh, well, thank you. Do you have another question? I would request that our subcommittee ask a CPB to give us an analysis. How much do they collect Excellent. at airports? How much do they spend at airports? We'll take your analysis and we'll get one from uh, the CBP as well. Thank you uh, for volunteering to do that. Appreciate both of you being here. And thanks again for waiting till the, the vote break. Thanks for, thanks for your back. testimony.